Greetings uh, to all of the participants in this very important conference. I think there is no more important uh, activity for us than the pursuit of peace. Uh, as we speak, we know that Ukraine is suffering uh, and tens or hundreds of thousands of people will die in the coming weeks and months if the uh, war continues on its current trajectory. Indeed, the whole world is at threat because this war could escalate to a nuclear war between the United States and Russia. Have no doubt that we are on a continuing path of escalation. Peace through negotiation is not only possible, but it was nearly achieved. Though, alas, our mainstream media in the US and Europe don't report basic facts anymore. Peace through negotiation was almost achieved in March 2022, just after Russia's invasion. Because in March 2022, the Ukrainian government and the Russian government exchanged documents and negotiated an agreement with the mediation of the government of Turkey and the informal mediation of then Prime Minister Naftali Bennett of Israel. This agreement was nearly reached and signed. And though you cannot find it in the press, the United States stopped the negotiations. It's very important to understand that. It's very hard to understand that through the wall of, of, of uh, uh, falsehoods and the wall of deception that surrounds this whole war in the West. The United States has not wanted a negotiated end to the war. And if we return from March 2022 to three months earlier, a negotiated settlement before the war was absolutely possible, again, not reported in our media. On December 17, 2021, President Vladimir Putin put on the table a draft U.S.-Russia security agreement. At the core of that agreement was that NATO would not enlarge to, the, to Ukraine and to the 2,000-kilometer border of Russia. This was not only a, uh, a concession that the United States should have made to avoid war, it was in America's interest, in Ukraine's interest, in Russia's interest, and in the world's interest. The idea that the United States should push its military alliance, its weapon systems, its bases up to the Russian border is mind-boggling in its recklessness. President Putin put a proposal on the table. I called the White House soon afterwards and beseeched the White House to negotiate on that basis. I explained to the White House how would the United States feel if Russia had bases in Mexico or China had bases in Mexico. The last time that was tried, the United States invaded the said country, which was Cuba, 60 years ago. The White House told me the U.S. will not negotiate with Russia over the enlargement of NATO. I said there will be war if there is not proper diplomacy. The White House did not want to avoid this war through diplomacy. It either thought that it could call the bluff 
of President Putin or have the war and accomplish what our defense secretary, better to say our war secretary, Lloyd Austin, publicly stated, and that is that the goal of this war is to weaken Russia. If the Ukrainians die and are, if Ukraine is destroyed in the middle, that's what a proxy war is. All my life, 68 years, I have witnessed U.S. proxy wars in Vietnam, in Laos, in Cambodia, in Nicaragua, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Libya, and now in Ukraine. The United States is not thinking about Ukraine. It's thinking about weakening its adversary or its perceived adversary, Russia. So diplomacy was stopped by the United States in March 2022. It was rejected by the United States in December 2021. And it was rejected by the United States between 2014 and 2021, because when the Minsk I agreement and Minsk II agreements were signed, the United States supported the government of Ukraine to not honor the agreement that Ukraine had signed. The purpose of the Minsk II agreements was to ensure the language uh, and uh, cultural rights of the people of the Donbas or Eastern Ukraine, overwhelmingly Russian ethnicity, with a system of autonomy, which the government of Ukraine agreed to, and in which France and Germany were to be the guarantors, and in which the entire UN Security Council unanimously backed. And the Ukraine government said, no, we don't want to implement what we have signed. The United States said, fine, we will send you arms. You don't have to implement that, even though the UN Security Council had signed. So in fact, the rejection of diplomacy goes back to late 2014 and early 2015. But in fact, the US rejection of diplomacy goes back even further. It goes back to February 2014, because in February 2014, again, never explored in our mainstream media, but obvious, obvious to anybody paying attention, the United States conspired to overthrow the government of Viktor Yanukovych, who was pursuing the path of neutrality in Ukraine. And if that sounds shocking, please go back and listen to the conversation between the then Assistant Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland, and the then U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Piat, which took place three weeks before the violent overthrow of the Yanukovych regime. In that call, Victoria Nuland described who would be the post Yanukovych government. Again, I'm 68 years old. I have lived through dozens of US regime change operations all over the world. I've seen some with my own eyes. And this one I saw very close up. And of course, there was a violent insurrection three weeks after the intercepted call and the government that was brought into place was exactly the one that Victoria Newland, as Assistant Secretary of State had described on the call to the US ambassador.
I was in Kiev soon afterwards. I learned firsthand how US funding from so-called NGOs had paid for a lot of the so-called Maidan revolution. This was the trigger of the war that really started nine years ago. Again, it was a rejection of diplomacy by the United States because the sitting president of Ukraine wanted neutrality, whereas the US government wanted NATO enlargement. That means that this conflict actually dates back even earlier to 2008, we can go. Because in 2008, George Bush put on the table that NATO would enlarge to Ukraine and to Georgia. If you look at a map, the US plan is absolutely clear and follows a line that had been spelled out a decade earlier by Zbigniew Brzezinski, the national security advisor to Carter and one of the leading US geostrategists. The idea was to encircle Russia in the Black Sea region, because with Ukraine and Georgia joining NATO, Russia would be encircled by Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia in the Black Sea. The idea clearly stated was to bottle up Russia so that Russia was no longer any problem to US policy. Where did the US want a free hand? It wanted to be able to replace governments at will in the Middle East. For example, overthrowing Saddam Hussein in 2003, overthrowing uh, Muammar Gaddafi in 2011, a NATO exercise, by the way, not just a US exercise, but a NATO exercise, overthrowing Bashar al-Assad in 2011. This is another point that's misunderstood. Uh, Bashar al-Assad and the so-called Syrian civil war is a US regime change operation gone terribly wrong. The idea was that the CIA would work with the regional governments to overthrow Bashar al-Assad. It failed. Several years later, Russia came to the assistance of its ally, and then our media pointed the finger at Russian intervention, ignoring the US intervention beforehand. There has been almost no reporting about the basic fact of Operation Timber Sycamore which was a order by President Obama that the CIA would overthrow Bashar al-Assad. I know a lot of this also directly from people who were absolutely involved and in trying to stop the war, but the United States opposed diplomacy. We can keep winding the clock back to truly understand what this is about. The US at every stage has rejected diplomacy and it goes back to actually 1990. In 1990, incidentally, I was an economic advisor to President Mikhail Gorbachev's economic team. Gorbachev wanted peace in Europe. He wanted a common European home. At that time, the United States and Germany promised, promised explicitly that NATO would not move one inch eastward. That was a lie and a phony promise. Gorbachev disbanded the Soviet-led military alliance, Germany reunified, and by 1992, the United States was already planning the massive expansion of NATO all the way to Ukraine. Historians are finding in the archives that the plan to expand NATO all the way to Ukraine dates back to 1992. Incidentally, Zbigniew Brzezinski wrote in 1997 in Foreign Affairs, 
a very clear article that lays out the explicit timeline for NATO enlargement, saying that between 2005 and 2010, Ukraine would join NATO. And of course, the invitation pushed by the United States came in 2008, just on Brzezinski's timeline. And note, this is well before Putin. This is well before any supposed threats coming from Russia. This was U.S military expansion planned for three decades now and nothing is to stop it not diplomacy not negotiation not avoidance of war not any truth telling in the newspapers and while the standard may call this a propaganda event i would welcome a public discussion with the editor of the standard at any moment to discuss these issues because these are facts this is the history this is not what's reported in our mainstream media now our mainstream media makes a false narrative that this war started with a quote unprovoked invasion on february 24th 2022 by Putin. That is the official Western narrative. The New York Times has repeated that claim 26 times in its editorials and its op eds, but it never allows anyone to tell the real history in the pages to the readership. And this is what's happening all over the US and all over Europe. We're talking to ourselves. We are leading to the destruction of Ukraine because there is no way in the world to have a military victory over Russia with NATO enlargement as the end result because Russia will continue to escalate as needed. Perhaps Russia will simply defeat Ukraine on the battlefield. That is quite possible. But if not, Russia will escalate and Russia has 1,600 deployed nuclear weapons. President Obama, though he contributed to this overthrow of Yanukovych, was also very clear in 2014, do not get into a war over this issue, because as he put it then, Russia has escalatory dominance meaning they can always raise the stakes up to and including nuclear war. We are on a reckless path based on falsehoods. This war could have been avoided at countless stages in the last 30 years. This war should never have broken out nine years ago because the United States should never be part of violent overthrows of other governments, but it's a bad habit of the United States. Europe should have enforced the Minsk II agreements backed by the UN Security Council, signed by Ukraine, instead of ignoring them, laughing at them. But the United States said, no, you don't have to follow those. We will arm you. The United States should have negotiated at the end of 2021. The United States should have applauded rather than stopped the negotiations in March 2022. So till today, there is a negotiating path that has been on the table. At the core is neutrality of Ukraine to keep the two nuclear superpowers away from each other. It's common sense. It is what the United States has demanded for two centuries in the Western Hemisphere. If the US neoconservatives were not so arrogant, reckless, and blind, it would have been agreed a long time ago. Till this moment, it is possible NATO, however, 
which is a US military alliance, insists that no third country, that is Russia or anybody else, has any right to have any say to where the US military alliance goes. That is reckless and it leads to war. And now have no doubt about the US irresponsibility, which is trying to place NATO offices in Asia. I think not even remembering that it's not the North Asia Treaty Organization, it is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It is not an expeditionary force for US hegemony. It was meant to defend Western Europe against the Soviet Union, which no longer exists. And yet the United States is trying to expand NATO now to Asia to fight China. Europeans are aghast, but the media are not explaining what this is about. And they are certainly not telling the truth that the war in Ukraine is a disaster that came from the unrelenting arrogance of the United States to keep pushing, provoking, provoking, and to avoiding every possibility of a diplomatic off-ramp. So let us help people to understand that negotiations till this moment are feasible and that President Biden needs to step forward and say NATO will stop its enlargement if Russia leaves and ends the fighting. And this will be the basis for peace. Let me close by noting that today exactly is the 60th anniversary of the greatest speech by any US president on peace, John F. Kennedy's peace speech given June 10, 1963 at the height of the Cold War. And what President Kennedy said is precisely relevant to us today. At the height of the Cold War, he had the clarity, the honesty, the eloquence and the leadership to say that the Soviet Union did not want war, the United States does not want war, we can negotiate peace. And President Kennedy called on Americans to reconsider their attitudes to the Cold War and to the Soviet Union. President Kennedy said we should hail the Russian people for their vast achievements in science and industry and culture. At the height of the Cold War, he dared to say this. He knew that the military industrial complex opposed him. He knew the generals resented a peace initiative, but the American people overwhelmingly supported it. And five weeks after President Kennedy's brilliant speech, which everybody can listen to online. Kennedy and Khrushchev signed the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And President Kennedy made a campaign in the United States over the heads of the military industrial complex to speak directly to the American people that peace is possible, that the US and the Soviet Union have a mutual interest in peace, that an agreement on peace will be in the interest of both sides and enforced by both sides. And President Kennedy carried the day when the Senate voted 80 to 19 to ratify the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. That is leadership. That is an expression of the true common good. That is what is possible today. Thank you very much.